from Pinston Masons, who's going to give us our legal update, but I'm sure you knew that, that's why you're here. Um, Kissy is an associate and a solicitor advocate for um, Pinston Masons in London, specialises mainly in cr criminal litigation and in the defence of regulatory investigations, particularly in health and safety. Um, she appears regularly as an advocate in court proceedings and coroner's inquest and has spoken at many seminars and lectures on the subject of health and safety and criminal law. So I'm not going to introduce her anymore because I'm very conscious, A, you don't want to hear me, uh, that's not what you hear for, um, just kind of nods with that, so thank you for that. Um, but I'm also very conscious that Kizzy has got a very uh, a tight deadline to leave, so um, she will be running out the door at quarter past seven, so we, we do need to manage her time and respect her time as well. So mm -hmm. enough of me, and I'll hand over to Kizzy. Thank you very much. voice, I don't necessarily need a microphone. Um, it's actually year six, I think, Nigel, I've, I've been here. I must, um, must be doing something right, because they've not told me not to come back, so I, I tend to put this out in the diary. Um, legal updates. Okay, I'm not as uh, large as life uh, like Andy Tomkinson. Um, I'm just a lowly lawyer. But I hope I've managed to pull together some of the ideas and things and issues that have come up in the last year that I hope you all will find fairly interesting. I hope, I've tried to tie them together with themes and issues that are going to be important to the likes of, of you and I. So yes, it's a legal update. There will be a lot of law. But even if you don't remember the facts of every single case I talk about, I'd rather you took away the key messages from those cases. So we will talk about corporate manslaughter again. Um, we've been talking about corporate manslaughter for, for the last six Six, six or so years. Um, I'll explain where we are now in terms of the types of cases and how they've been disposed of and again key themes that are running through some of those cases. Sentencing trends, that's quite an important one because yes there have been a lot of cases but we're now starting to see an increase in the level of fines that are being dished out to corporates. Risk and health and safety duties, well I think a number of us, if not everybody in this room, is aware of the Corporate uh, Health and Safety Duty, Section 2, Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. What does it mean in practice and how are the courts dealing with the issues of those, dis those duties, and discharge of those duties and risk? And we'll talk a little bit about CDM. I'm not going to focus on CDM because if you come to the construction legal update on the 3rd of December, you'll hear a bit more about construction. And so we'll touch on, on the issues there. And finally, fees for intervention, is it working? I will leave you to answer that question. Um, but my slides will talk about where we are uh, now with uh, consultation and uh, the review of fees for intervention. So, rattling through corporate manslaughter. Please say everyone in this room knows what corporate manslaughter is by now. I've been doing it for six years and I know there's some regulars here. So, everyone know what corporate manslaughter is? Good. Okay. We know it's, it's not a new offence, but it brings into play um, the manslaughter offence for corporates only. We are looking, when we're talking about corporate manslaughter, we're looking at senior management, we're looking at the organisation and management of activities, and whether or not there has been a significant failure by senior management in their organisation and management of those activities in their business, and whether or not that has caused or contributed significantly to um, fatality. Now, it's been enforced since 2008. You would think by now we'd have many more convictions, many more prosecutions. We haven't. Um, seven convictions to date, only two trials, so only two corporates have had the uh, appetite to fight, and we've had five guilty pleas. Predominantly, we're talking about fairly medium to small size companies, but I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute. Two acquittals, which is not too bad uh, for the defence side. Right? And um, we've had two further charges brought. I'll talk about those cases a little bit. Stericycle is ongoing now. That case started a couple of weeks ago. Facts of the case are that Stericycle, well known as waste, waste and recycling, um, they have um, a, what's it called? an autoclave. It's like a pressure vessel um, where they put all the waste in and it kind of recycles it and cleans it and then it's, it's all lovely and, and bright spanking new. 
Unfortunately for Stereocycle, at one of their sites, uh, the autoclave had a fault in the um, closing mechanism or locking mechanism of the autoclave. Unfortunately, there was an explosion where one of the workers was very close to, uh, to the autoclave and he unfortunately died as a result of the explosion. If you go on YouTube, there's a fantastic video of um, the actual explosion. You can just see it from, from miles, uh, the smoke. But a guy died, um, an employee who was nearby uh, was also uh, seriously injured. Now, in that case, Stericycle are facing a number of charges, including corporate manslaughter. So they are in the middle of a trial at the moment. I think they're still in the prosecution case. We're now two weeks in, they're still in the prosecution case. And it looks like it's going to run uh, for a little while. Um, the issue there is not just the corporate, but they're actually there looking at the individual director who was responsible for making sure that the uh, machine, pressure vessels in general, they're all being maintained uh, properly. So that's something to watch where we're looking at not just the corporate but individual uh, participation. Piranha mouldings, um, in that case, it's a factory worker who was unfortunately burnt to death as a result of, um, I think he, he slipped into an industrial oven. <coughs> God, these, these cases are so cheery. Um, but he slipped into an industrial oven and unfortunately died. In that case, very similar MO. We've got corporate manslaughter for corporate some individual health and safety offences for some of the directors. And also in this case, there's a section six, which is a very little known part of the Health and Safety at Work Act, directed at uh, manufacturers. So they're encompassing quite a lot of issues, not just maintenance, not just the ownership of uh, the, 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 the issues <coughs> and, and the, the things that are on site, but also manufacturer, because it's manufactured on site. So again, these two cases we are Waiting with bated breath to see how those will turn out. For corporate manslaughter, why, why is it so important? Well, the reason why corporates are getting all very excited about it is because of the, the penalties. It's looking at an unlimited fine as an ultimate penalty. Now, for the larger corporates, when you're talking about an unlimited fine, you, you, we're looking at sort of millions of pounds. So for the likes of Balfour BT, Network Rail, you know, they're, they're worried what a corporate manslaughter prosecution could do to them. As I said at the beginning, so far it's been fairly small companies, so the, the fines themselves have not necessarily been that huge. But, you know, as we say, we watch and see. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I will be coughing throughout because I have caught a little cold from my daughter. Um, <laughs> the Sentencing Guidelines Council, and I will talk about uh, the guidelines a little bit uh, further on, but Sentencing Guidelines Council came up with um, definitive guidance talking about the levels of fines that we should be looking at when we're talking about corporate manslaughter. And we are always having in mind that if we're dealing with a corporate manslaughter prosecution, you're looking at no less than £500,000 uh, for a fine that involves a fatality as a result of senior management <coughs> failures. On the flip side, for a health and safety offence, the guidance also says when it's a health and safety at work act prosecution, the fine, when it results in a fatality, should seldom be less than £100,000. So we're still looking at pretty, I mean, six figures each way, and that's something that companies are very alive to, um, which is why they're concerned about corporate manslaughter. Remedial orders are also being dished out. Um, remedial orders basically mean we are ordering you to fix the problem that uh, was in place at the time that we suspect, we suspect caused the incident. So those are being handed out. But they're not so important. Publicity orders are what I would suggest are more important because it doesn't just deal with whatever the fine was, that always hits the pockets of the corporate. What's more important to most companies is their reputation and what the public perceives them to be. Publicity orders, and we'll talk a bit more about them in, in a minute, they expose what's happened in court. So you are under a duty if a publicity <coughs> order is imposed to give the details of the offence the fine, sometimes the comments of the judge, and the judge can dictate which publications that is published in. So for most, if it's an industry incident, so for example, we talk about the autoclave, the pressure vessels incident uh, for Stericycle, they could, as a result of a successful prosecution, dictate that the details of the conviction is placed in, in an industry magazine, and that's going to hit a corporate, much harder than sort of the local rag uh, in, in Newcastle, for example. So again, these are the things that companies are, are very aware of. Now, 
The cases that we've had so far, again, num a number of you will be uh, familiar with Cotswolds. That was the first case. It was a Vincent Mason's case. Um, but it, 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 it's the first case where corporate manslaughter was tested. We don't think it's been tested. Thanks. Um, it's not been tested to the, the best degree that it could have done. But Cotswolds, and again, forgive me if you all are very aware of the fact that that was the young geotechnical engineer who, about two years qualified, was sent down into a trench to be testing uh, trial pits. And unfortunately, um, he was working for a, a fairly small company, an old school director who didn't believe in writing things down and didn't believe in risk assessments. Everything was, you know, we look at it and we, we can judge it. And unfortunately, Alex Wright, the geotechnical engineer, died as a result of being buried in the trench due to adverse weather conditions. He shouldn't have been in the trench at the time. Um, in that case, the individual director, because the business was so small, the individual director was essentially seen as the company. There were only eight, eight people uh, working for the company. Cost was a bit, was a, bit of a funny case because although it was corporate manslaughter, there was individual manslaughter for the director. That got pushed to one side, and also health and safety offences for both the company and the director. That got pushed to one side. The reason it got pushed to one side is because Mr. Eaton, the director, was terminally ill, suffering from cancer. So although it didn't get put to one side but for legal reasons, it was more of a kind of um, sort of in the interests of, 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 of his um, own health, he couldn't face a, a trial. However, the company did face corporate manslaughter <coughs> and were found guilty. The fine that was given was 385,000. It was fairly huge at the time because it was the first one. We just thought it, it was quite a huge fine. Um, that fine is still being paid. I'm pleased to know that Mr. Eason is still alive. Um, now, following on from Cotswolds, we had a number of other cases that followed, but nothing in the region of the, this 500,000 pound fine that we've been looking for, so you'll see. JMW Farms, that was a, a young worker who was washing the inside of a, a, a large bin and it fell um, on top of him. It was meant to be being held up by a forklift truck and unfortunately the forks were not the right size to hold this bin up. So he was crushed uh, by a bin. It was a, the first Irish case. Fine is £187,500. Again, not very huge, but JMW, small company. Lion Steel. Uh, that was a bit of a fight. That was a young maintenance worker who was working on the top um, of a roof. He was going to fix a roof light. Um, he wasn't particularly trained at working at height, but felt that he could do this job because it would be a quick, a quick, a quick fix. Um, in that case, the interesting part of that case is not so much the prosecution. Yes, there was a bit of a fight uh, who should be facing prosecution. The individual directors, not just the directors at that particular site, but directors on different sites. And we're not talking just operational directors, we're talking finance directors. We were talking health and safety directors. And again, it was said that their involvement in the management and organisation of activities at the incident site was so important and so critical to management of health and safety in general that they should be prosecuted in their personal capacity. In that case, eventually, after about a year and a half, the case was actually dropped against the three um, directors. But the company, as a sort of bargaining tool, accepted corporate manslaughter. And they faced the highest fine to date, which is £480,000. Jane Murray and Sons, again, we're looking at quite similar. All these things that are falling onto people or they're getting sucked into things. Uh, Jane Murray, another Irish case, very small fine in, in, in the scheme of things, £100,000. Um, but in that case, the employee um, was working on an animal feed machine and he was killed by the rotating blades as he slipped um, into the machine. There was a lack of uh, guarding, I think, on, on, that, on that case. Again, that was a guilty plea. So we're starting to see there's not much fighting going on, but we've had a bit and we've had some high fines, but nothing in the region that we expected. Prince's Sporting Club. Now, this was a very small fine as far as we're concerned, 34,000. Um, but it, it did <coughs> essentially deal with the whole of the company. It was all the assets were worth. Um, but costs far outweighed uh, the um, amount of assets, £100,000, payable within 28 days. 
pretty difficult for Princess Sporting Club. Again, this was slightly more uh, well publicised, I think, because this was the banana boat. I don't know how many of you know about this one, but it was a young girl on her birthday, banana boat being driven around. Unfortunately, there wasn't a particularly adequate risk assessment in that case, and the driver of the banana boat wasn't aware that someone had fallen <coughs> into the water. So the thing that was towing the uh, banana boat, unfortunately, um, drove round and then it hit the, the person that had uh, fallen into the, the water, uh, who unfortunately died. So in that case, small fine, but huge costs. We'll talk again about Prince's Sporting Club because they got the first ever publicity order. Mobile sweepers, again, very small fine, 8,000 plus 4,000 costs. The only interesting part about this case is not particularly interesting, again, someone being crushed by the bin. Um, the interesting part about this case is the director's responsibility. The director was responsible for everything. Mobile Sweepers wasn't a huge uh, company, but the director was personally responsible for a lot of things, including maintenance. And it was said in this case, because um, the person that died um, there was a fault with the machine that was carrying the bins, and it was a very obvious risk. The director was seen to be personally responsible. Now, this is the hugest fine I've seen so far for an individual director, £183,000. That's a lot of money for an individual, even a director. Um, but on top of that, he faced disqualification from, from acting as a director for five years. So we're starting to see not so much huge fines for corporate, in corporate manslaughter, but more about how do we target those individuals that should be and ought to be responsible for the management of health and safety. Cavendish and Masonry, that is an ongoing matter only because um, there was a trial. Um, this is a case where I think a young guy, 23 year old, was stuck by a bit of uh, limestone, a huge chunk of limestone. Um, and it had fallen after being lifted um, on a lintel. But there was nothing guarding that slab. So it was only being held up by its own weight. And unfortunately, this young guy just crushed by a massive um, limestone slab. In that case, the company accepted it had a duty of care, but didn't feel that it had breached its duty of care because it had policies, procedures in place. It's just on this occasion, the guarding uh, for the um, machine was missing. The company was convicted. It had previously pleaded guilty to a health and safety offence, but the company has not yet been sentenced. So we are waiting for the, uh, the level of fine in that case. Now, so we've had a few corporate manslaughters, a bit better than a few years ago where we don't have three. Um, we've had a few. As I said, the important part so far of corporate manslaughter has been publicity orders, because that's what everybody is worried about. They're not so worried about the fine, because a lot of them do have assets, they do have pockets, they do have that money that they could pay out for a huge fine. <coughs> However, publicity orders are the thing that's going to damage their credibility and their reputation. It's a power that the courts have to impose. They haven't used it in every case, as we've seen. It's only been so far in two cases, but it, as I said before, in if they are ordering a publicity order as a result of a conviction, you have to publish details of the conviction, the particulars of the offence, the fine, and also any remedial orders. And that will be where the judge says, I order you to do this. You need to fix this because there is a risk that this could happen again, and you must do this within a certain amount of time. All of that would then be published in a publication of the judge's choice. So as I said, in Prince's, the, the banana boat one, details were published in a powerboat magazine. How many of you pick up a powerboat magazine? Not many, I hope. <laughs> um, but for, for Prince's Sporting Club, a lot of their business and referrals and adverts were in a powerboat magazine. So they're targeting the right audience. It's those people that are looking to perhaps work with Prince's Sporting Club, they might think again about it because they'll be aware of the conviction. Similarly with um, mobile sweepers, it was um, published in local newspapers. So not so much BBC.co.uk, but they're worried about the local rank because those people then have local businesses and local people, they know mobile sweepers and reading very well. I said we've had two acquittals. Uh, PS and JE Wars, that was a young person working for a nursery who got electrocuted. 
Um, very odd. I think it's because of an overhead power cable. It got caught up somehow. Um, but they did accept a breach for a health and safety offence, and they were fined fifty thousand pounds. The corporate man stores up went out. MS mining again. That was probably a bit more well known. The, the important part about MS mining was that not just the company was prosecuted for corporate manslaughter. We were now not dealing with directors, we were dealing with site owners. So the site owner um, was prosecuted for manslaughter. Four people died. In this case, um, the site owner gave a direction. They were meant to blow up a particular uh, mine. It, the mine flooded. It was well known that it was prone to flooding. Um, but the mine flooded. Seven miners were in there, three escaped four unfortunately died. The site owner was personally prosecuted for four counts of manslaughter. And as a result of trial, he managed to get off all four uh, uh, charges of manslaughter. So it was, a, it was a great success because it was felt that there was too much on the shoulders of this site owner. And on top of that, he actually carried out a risk assessment. And on the basis of his assessment of the risks involved and his experience and what he'd known about the area, he gave a direction on the basis that it was well founded. He was justified in giving the direction and it was unfortunate that the mine flooded in that case. Now, I've spoken a bit about corporate manslaughter and we haven't had that many. I, I still say in the, in the years, since 2008, we still haven't had that many corporate manslaughter prosecutions. However, I, I say they're coming. I've been saying that for two years as well, but I think they are coming because the, the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, who are responsible for bringing prosecutions of this nature, they are under heavy criticism. A bit like uh, the HSC were when they were dealing with investigations and how long they were taking. Uh, Crown Prosecution Service are under similar criticism because they're saying, look, we brought in this, this, that. We, there was lots of difficulties with corporate manslaughter as it was in the old, uh, in the old days under the old law. What are you doing with this act? CPS are now saying, well, okay, maybe we need to look at the amount of investigations that we undertake for corporate manslaughter and transfer those and translate them into prosecutions. So in February this year, there were 48 active investigations. But in the last two years, so three years, there have been 147 cases considered for a corporate manslaughter prosecution. I think now that we're in October, the 48 uh, figure, has increased somewhat. Um, there are a number of ongoing corporate manslaughter investigations. It's just a matter of time before those are translated into actual prosecutions. Sentencing trends. Okay. I touched upon this sentencing uh, council guidelines. There are some guidelines about the levels of sentences and the levels of uh, punishment that should be imposed uh, for health and safety offences. If you are not already aware of that, it's readily available on, on websites. You can go to the Sentencing Council uh, website to look for that. It's definitive guidance here. It's not law, but it is guidance, and it's persuasive in Scotland and Northern Ireland. You might as well say it applies everywhere, because basically when courts are looking at health and safety matters, they're not particularly familiar with the criminal health and safety <coughs> interaction. Most courts, most Crown courts that deal with health and safety matters are dealt with by criminal judges. When I say criminal, I mean dirty crime. The murders, the manslaughters, the robbers, the burglars. They don't necessarily deal with health and safety every day. And we, we discovered this when we were dealing with a, a fire safety uh, prosecution for Shell. And we were brought in front of a judge in a London Crown Court and he looked at that and instead of looking at the wording and it was about it was about risk it was about the risk of serious injury or death and in that case there wasn't as far as we were concerned a, a risk of serious injury or death we were talking about two small fires put out straight away very little inconvenience prohibition notice served rectified within two days but in that case the judge looked at the papers and he looked at that wording and he said risk of serious injury or death something i cannot deal with put that up to the higher court. And a lot of magistrates are doing exactly the same thing. They will not deal with health and safety matters. So it's important to have this type of guidance because the judges just don't know what they're talking about. And uh, forgive me if there are any judges, magistrates in the room, I know you mean well, 
but I think there needs to be a lot more put into the training and the understanding of judges because they won't all be familiar with health and safety issues and matters and they do need that guidance. So this guidance is pretty good actually and they do stick to it. It applies only to companies, not to individuals. So that's something for them to work on uh, in the near future. It applies to corporate manslaughter and as I said to any uh, prosecution under the Health and Safety at Work Act where there has been a fatality. And it only applies to cases after February 2010. Now, we had some recent cases. Again, some of you will be aware of the cases, some not. The facts of the cases are not necessarily um, that important. But we had the cases of Sellafield and Network Rail. Both of them were facing uh, a number of regulatory breaches, whether it be environmental or otherwise, but it was um, an accepted breach of regulatory health and safety environmental offences. The significance of these two appeals, which I'll come on to a minute, in a minute, was that it confirmed that the level of corporate fines that were being dished out for the likes of Sellafield and Network Rail would be uh, very high, even when there hasn't been any harm caused. Now, remember we talked about corporate manslaughter. We were dealing with fairly small to medium-sized companies. The fines are pretty much all below 500,000. These cases were dealing with much higher fines. And the reason we were dealing with higher fines is because of the corporates that were involved. You've all heard of Sellafield. You've all heard of Network Rail. And Network Rail have not got a particularly good reputation uh, in, in recent years for health and safety. So all of this is, is known to the court. And because of that, they were imposed a fairly high fine. So I've put them up there. For Sellafield, they had a breach of seven uh, infringements of environmental legislation to do with um, disposal of radioactive waste. In that case, no one was harmed. It was detected, they put a stop to it, but however, they were prosecuted. And they were prosecuted on the basis that if it had continued, if exposure had been continued, there would be a very high risk that the people in the areas could have been exposed to skin cancer or could, could have contracted skin cancer. So it was difficult because Sellafield felt agreed. No one's been harmed in this case. We've done what we could. We, when we're aware of it, we've dealt with it. We've addressed the problem. However, they're prosecuted and they're fined £700,000. That's huge. Similarly, Network Rail were fined £500,000. Now, in that case, there was an accident. A young boy, um, he suffered serious brain injury after the train collided with um, another vehicle. Uh, I think it was another, another train or a vehicle collided with a train um, on an open level crossing. So there was an accident in that case. But you might be thinking, well, there was an accident there. Why is it a lower fine? Now, the reason for the lower fine, there's a number of reasons. But they both appealed for the same reasons. Now, reasons for appeal was this. Both companies argued the level of fines that were dished out, 500,000 and 700,000, surely should be reserved for those serious fatalities. For the likes of you who remember Hatfield Rail Crash, that, that's the sort of thing that would attract these huge fines when we're dealing with multiple fatalities or huge risk of harm. In both cases, Sellafield, no harm, Network Rail, one person injured. So they, they both appealed on the basis that these were manifestly excessive fines. However, the courts took a different view. Now, the courts said, in all cases, the financial circumstances of the company should be taken into account, which they are done, because even for individuals, you're told to go in and you sign a means form and you say how much you can afford each week, and if you're convicted, they give you a fine that is commensurate to the amount of money that you earn and the amount of disposable income you have to pay a fine. So the court said this should, the same approach should be done for corporates, which they did. And they took into account the company's respective turnovers. So Sellafield had a turnover of 1.6 billion and Network Rail had a turnover of 6.2 billion. Now, applying that to companies that have huge turnover, a quote, the judge said 
it would, ex it would examine with great care and in some detail the structure of the company, its turnover, profitability, as well as, most importantly, remuneration for directors. So we're now not just talking about the position of the company, but we're talking about individuals. I think you're starting to see a theme. Because with corporate manslaughter, they were doing exactly the same thing. They're looking at responsibilities of individual directors. What did they do? What should they have done? In this case, though, for sentencing, they're looking at how much money do those directors go home with at the end of the day. We all talk about British Gas and flat flats, etc., etc. Very similar. They're looking behind the veil of the corporate, and they're looking at directors and how much money that and profit they are making from the business. So they did that in these two cases. Now, the court also made a distinction here between Sellerfield and Network Rail and what they do with their profits. So, Network Rail actually reinvest. Well, this is what they, they, they said in court, they reinvest into rail infrastructure. That went down very well with the courts, hence the £500,000 fine. Sellerfield, however, used their profits and turned them into shareholder dividends, which didn't go down very well. <laughs> so they got a very huge fine. But unsurprisingly, to be honest with you, both appeals failed. And they both failed on the basis that they felt the fines were appropriate because they did look at the overall structure and organisation and remuneration of all directors. So although they tried to appeal on the basis that there wasn't a huge fatality or huge risk, it almost doesn't matter now in some environmental cases because they are looking at the potential for risk, but they're also looking at not just seriousness of the offence, but what actually happens behind the scenes. Where does money go? And if as a result of an offence that was committed, so for example, the um, issue of the radioactive waste not being disposed of properly, there may be a, a suggestion that as a company, they're benefiting <coughs> from not disposing of it properly because it would cost them to dispose of the waste properly. So in order for them to save some money, they're not doing it properly, and therefore that money and that saving is going in the pockets of the directors. The courts want to now pierce that veil of the corporate and go for the directors and hit them where it hurts. And in, in, in that case, there's a quote from the judge there, the fine does say it must be fixed with the objective of ensuring that the message is brought home to directors and members of the company, which is usually the shareholders. Now, there's another case which I think goes some way to cementing that view that we are looking at what's going on with the company, not just the offence. Southern Water Limited, they appealed against a huge fine, again, £200,000, the fact that they um, had failed to uh, fulfil their duty in the um, arena of discharging untreated sewage into the sea. It was a particularly huge fine because the discharge of, of sewage occurred over a period of six months, and it was dealt with uh, once it was detected. There wasn't any harm, but again, the court said, notwithstanding that fact, there was potential for serious harm uh, to, the, to the local uh, economy. Now, this case, they looked at turnover, but in this case, they felt that the defendant themselves hadn't taken any necessary steps to prevent the risk of harm. Well, the defendant said, well, we have. Um, we've done what we can to make sure that this wouldn't happen. Um, unfortunately, we didn't detect it for six months, but when we did, we, we did something about it. Unfortunately, that didn't cut any mustard with the court, because they then asked, well, tell us what your practical steps were. And in this case, I don't know why they did it, but Southern Water didn't explain what steps they had taken to prevent the potential discharge of untreated sewage. They just said they did. Now, perhaps if they'd given a proper explanation, we wouldn't be in this situation. But in this case, the judge upheld the fine. And they upheld the fine because they wanted it to be a clear message to the lower courts that despite the fact that there's no actual harm, lower courts will not be um, able to deal with these types of offences because of the potential risk of harm. So I think the, the actual effect of cases like this and cases like Sellafield and Network Rail is not just to tell us the fines are going to be huge, but also to convince the lower courts that they cannot 
possibly deal with offences like this. We all, we all thought at one stage that it was health and safety offences that weren't going to be dealt with uh, by the lower courts. And it looks like environmental offences are now going to be placed into that same pot. So they're going to try and convince the higher courts to deal with them. They're also going to show that the, the accounts of a business, and as I said, the remuneration of directors should be looked at very carefully before sentencing. It also looks like the prosecuting authorities are going to take a greater involvement in sentencing. Normally, once there's a conviction, the, the prosecuting authorities sit back and don't do very much. In all three of these cases, the prosecuting authorities had something to say. And they were quite proactive about saying that there are a number of things that should have been done that weren't done. And they were, they were quite vocal about that. So it looks like that's another trend. Prosecution are going to become more involved in sentencing. We talked about sentencing guidelines for corporate manslaughter and health and safety at work act offences where there's a fatality. There's also been some guidelines for environmental offences, unsurprisingly. However, I'm not sure how helpful these are going to be. Um, they've, they've only been a, around for a few months. Um, there is, has been some talk that they are trying to encourage the lower courts to have unlimited fines available for them so that they free up some of the, the court time uh, that's being taken up by, by Crown Court. But whether that's uh, going to take place, I don't know. However, the guidelines apply to all relevant um, environmental offences. They apply after the 1st of July, regardless of whenever the offence took place. And they are trying to link fines to the seriousness of the offence. That's always been the case, but they're setting out in categoric terms culpability of individual and corporates, and also the level of harm that is involved. Risk. Okay. I think we've talked about risk. Some of you will recognise this slide. Again, there are the, the, the generic overarching health and safety duties for corporates, which we know, section two, the duty to ensure health and safety of employees, Section 3, the similar duty for non-employees. Um, that is uh, qualified by, in the middle, the duty is so far as reasonably applicable. However, the duty is a positive duty to make sure that there is a state of affairs that is free from material risk. Now, about two years ago, there was a bit of debate between prosecution and defence lawyers about what does material risk mean. Okay. Audience participation. What do you think material risk is? The courts don't know, so you, you might have a head start. <laughs> um, what, what do you think material risk would be? What is a, what is a material risk? A genuine risk. A genuine risk, yep. Yeah. Tangible. Tangible. Realistic. Realistic, very good. A clear breach. Clear breach. That these are these are the sorts of words that have been bandied around to qualify and quantify what is a material breach. And case law has tried to do that. Now, in order for a material risk to become apparent to a company, it has to be reasonable to guard against that risk. So, as I've said, their reasonable practicability limits that duty to maintain a safe uh, state of affairs, and it, to, to guard against risk. It allows organisations to discharge the duty if you can prove that if you were going to impose preventative measures in place to make sure that there was this safe state of affairs, it has to be proportionate to the amount of cost and effort that would be put in to in, in instituting those preventative measures. So it is, the, whatever the preventative measure is, as opposed to the cost and effort of instituting those measures. And that has to be balanced up. If it's something that is going to cost way more than the assets of the company are worth, you can justify not imposing that preventative measure and, and vice versa. So that's where the reasonable practicability comes in. Why do we talk about risk? Well, we've had a few cases very recently um, that deal with risk, one of which was the M5 motorway crash. How many of you have heard of the, the M5 case? Again, that was quite, quite well known, so I won't go into too much detail about that. 
Geoffrey <coughs> Council was um, the organiser of a fireworks display at Taunton Rugby Club. Um, he went out of his way, I mean, he, he, he did his research, risk assessments galore, made sure that everything was carried out safely. He even went to the, to the trouble of talking to a highways agency, Taunton Dean Borough Council, Avon Somerset Police, all of which had representatives at the fireworks display. Now, after doing that, no one could come up with any other additional risks that might occur as a result of the fireworks display, so it went ahead with the preventative measures that were in place. Unfortunately, on that day, it was quite a foggy day. Now, couple the fog with smoke from a fireworks display. Due to whatever scientific uh, reasoning we can come up with, together, it doesn't make a good combination. So it, it, it really did affect the visibility on the M5, which was very near uh, to where Taunton Rugby Club was situated. And as a result, there was a huge pileup on the M5. And it was said that the, the, the pilot was caused by the lack of visibility, caused by the fireworks display. Now, you would think that perhaps the, the company uh, that was responsible for uh, putting on the fireworks display would be prosecuted. However, Mr. Council, in his personal capacity, faced seven counts of manslaughter. Now, there were seven fatalities and, and a number um, of 51 injured. However, those counts of manslaughter were dropped because it was said, in, in no uncertain terms, that it was pretty ridiculous to blame Mr. Council um, for the deaths of these people because the risk of the lack of visibility on the M5, which was some way away, um, was not foreseeable. And that was accepted uh, by the court. However, Section 3, so the, the duty owed uh, to uh, the non-employees, so everybody else uh, who was on the road, remained. And there was a trial. Now, after the trial, the judge, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the uh, result was an acquittal of Mr. Council, for which he was extremely grateful. But some of the comments that were made are interesting. The comments that Mr. Council made, which I think are quite valid, are, it was a foggy night, and the fireworks did produce smoke, and it would have mingled with the fog. However, I saw nothing that caused me to believe that any fireworks smoke would cause a hazard. And on, on, on top of that, there were a thousand people at the display, including serving police officers, including fire officers. Not a single one raised a concern about the smoke or the fog at the time. And the final comment is probably what tipped, tipped the balance, because the judge said, in concluding the case, the prosecution case was based on hindsight and consequence as a result of what happened rather than foresight and risk. When we're talking about health and safety and preventing these type of incidents, we have to rely on foresight and risk because there's no point going back in hindsight because nobody could uh, be expected to appreciate every single risk, which we do in hindsight. So he was acquitted which I think was probably the, the right result in the circumstances. Why is this important? Well, as I said, we're talking about risk, material risk. And, and the cases that occurred in the last couple of years debated what was material risk. It's got to be real. I think someone said real or tangible. Um, not a fanciful risk, not a pie in the sky risk. It's got to be a risk that's not theoretical. Something that would require a reasonable person to do something about it. So it's important to have foresight without the benefit of hindsight. And the M5 case really touched upon that. Polyfloor. Again, this talks about risk but in a slightly different way. How many of you have people <coughs> working for you? Your employers. Your employers. Yeah, we've got a couple. How many of you think that it is fair for the employer to be blamed if the employee does something particularly stupid? Um, that's the common sense approach. However, in policy, <coughs> facts of this case are um, that there was a young technical support engineer who was undertaking some maintenance work. The machine that he was using was blocked, and as a result of that blockage, there was a temporary permit to work raised so that they could operate without the guard in, in place. He took it upon himself to get a spanner. Um, he stuck it in the, in, in the conveyor belt, somewhere in the conveyor belt, 
and unfortunately he couldn't let go of the spanner in time and it pulled him in. So he broke his arm. He's lucky that he didn't die. Um, but in the trial, quite uh, helpfully, he accepted that he was stupid. He said, I did a silly thing. I became very blase about it. I knew the machine very well. I thought I had enough time to stick the spanner in and do what I had to do and get out, but I didn't. And he said it was a foolish risk. Now, there are other cases that have talked about the culpability of an employee that just does something that is so <laughs> beyond the scope of their job that how on earth could the, the employer be blamed? So in this case, Polis Law argued the same. They said, look, yeah, our guy was silly. He did a silly thing, and any risk that was apparent was entirely attributable to the foolish act of the employee who has accepted that he did a stupid thing. Right? And it's not about our safe systems of work, and we didn't have safe systems of work, and there's one followed. That's not the case here. The case is we did have a lovely safe system of work. Unfortunately, in this case, the employee didn't follow it, and he did something on the of his own. So we haven't breached health and safety legislation. Court of Appeal, despite the fact that they accepted the accident was caused by the employee, they felt that as a result of the guarding being removed, as a result of the permit to work, or temporary permit to work uh, being lifted, that there was the existence of a risk that polyfloor were fully aware of. And as a result of lack of guarding, there should have been additional measures put in place to prevent an accident like this occurring. So in this case, the employer was vicariously liable for its silly employee's uh, actions. So why do we talk about risk here? Well, we talk about risk here because it's something that should have been looked at very early on. Not just as a result of the blockage, but at risk assessment stage. What the courts are pretty much saying is that even though for a successful prosecution, the prosecution had to prove that there was some evidence of a foreseeable risk, once they show there's a possibility of danger to an employee, that's it. The prosecution have done their job. It then goes to the defence to then show that they have done everything reasonably practicable to prevent the exposure of risk. And that is where Polyfloor's defence uh, team failed, because they weren't able to show that in light of the, the garden uh, being removed. So what the courts were saying in this case is that employers, if they want to avoid being in a position like this, might want to be looking at their risk assessment stage and looking at considering <coughs> the likelihood that employees might depart from their safe systems of work. So on top of everything else, that employee, employees have to do. They've also got to now preempt the fact that their employees, who they select as being competent and suitable and to do the job, might actually depart from the safe system, systems at work. What else are we meant to do as employers? I mean, it's, it's, it's quite onerous. But this case, and, and because it's quite recent, it's something that has to be taken into account. This case went to show, um, it, on top of tangerine, the cases that I was talking about that talked about material and fanciful risk, were cases like um, Chargo and Tangerine, uh, Veolia. They talked about the, what, what risk was all about. It talks about not just obvious risks, but not so obvious risks. And it just basically means that the court can get you any which way they want to. It's just leaving it quite open for them. And that seems to be where the approach that's being taken by courts at, at the moment, is that really they're expecting employers to not just deal with the obvious real and non-fanciful risks, but also those non, uh, not so obvious risks. CDM. Okay, some of you will uh, have great investment in this. Um, I can't uh, profess to be fully au okay fait with what is being proposed uh, by uh, the, the CDM 2015. Um, I'm sure many of, of us here will say exactly the same. It's a bit clear as mud. However, it's suggested that the changes and the proposed changes, which I have outlined, because there's quite a number of them, will come into play in April 2015. Personally, I'm still quite sceptical of that. I think uh, nothing will come in until after the election. But we wait to see. 
it's going to get rid of CDM as, as we know it, and there are a number of, of, of changes that are afoot. Um, there was a consultation that was open up until June, and I have summarised uh, the recommendations that have come out of the consultation, but there are a number of concerns um, for those in the construction sector um, that you know these changes, what, what will they mean? And they're probably not uh, particularly workable. So, for example, for designers, principal contractors, contractors, it looks like it's going to be business as usual. For clients who have had fairly little to do with uh, CDM management in the greater scheme of things, and principal designers, they've got new duties. And unfortunately for CDMCs, they are saying bye-bye. Because uh, CDMCs are no longer going to be a, 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 a structured part of the CDM regime. Well, what are the main changes? I've listed them there because it's probably easier for you to look at them rather than for me to go through them. But um, just so that you're aware, it's making the CDM regulations a bit easier to understand um, and taking you through the actual progression of a project. Again, this remains uh, something to be seen. Um, the drafting of, of CDM and the appropriate guidance that's going to go with it um, is going to be important. It's something that people have, have raised some uh, concern about. As I said, CDMCs are going and they're going to be replaced with a principal designer. Concern with that uh, suggestion is that principal designers, A, don't have the inclination to want to take on the, the role of coordinating uh, projects, but also that they won't be competent enough uh, to do it. Again, there's been some response to that, and I'll, I'll tell you what that is now. No ACOPs. Now, for the likes of uh, lawyers like me, we quite like ACOPs because they're very wordy and they're pretty good documents to go into court and, and target uh, uh, the opposite side. However, for most people, the ACOPs was a long-winded document, lots of pages, and most people didn't read it. So it was felt that and agreed that there should be some targeted guidance. Rather than an ACOP, a new ACOP, there will be a smaller, easy to read, easy to follow, targeted guidance. Competency, sore point for most, but they're getting rid of the requirement, um, the regulation for competence uh, requirements, and they're replacing it with more generic requirements. Not so much dealing with individual competence, but a bit more wiser, a bit more generic. Again, the practicalities of that will remain to be seen, because if you lose the competency requirement, that can cause its own issues in relation to the progression of a project and monitoring the project. Notification requirements uh, are slightly different. Um, I think I've got that on the next slide, so we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, the client now has more responsibilities. The client is responsible to apply to the principal uh, contra contractor and principal designer roles. And also, CDM is now going to apply to domestic clients, whereas it didn't before. However, in practice, it's not going to make much difference because that duty can be delegated to a contractor to fulfil. The issues <coughs> I've raised here, I've said that these are some of the concerns I have, and these are personal views. Uh, for some of these proposed changes. So getting rid of the CDMC, it means the, the coordinator essentially is going to be the designer, who has got to be part of the project team. Again, is that the right person for the job? During the transition from CDM 2007 to 2015, what happens? Well, there's a suggestion that a, a principal designer has got to be appointed as soon as possible, or the CDMC can stay in place for six months or until the project ends, or whatever, whatever is sooner. Interaction between principal designers and principal contractors very rarely happens at the moment, but that's got to now be encouraged during a, uh, a progression of a project. Pre-construction and construction phases, these need to be clearly defined. Competency I've, I've spoken about, we're going to revert back to what is actually akin to the health and safety um, training, supervision, monitoring. So we've got there. Any person appointing a contractor must ensure that that contractor has the necessary information, instruction, training, and appropriate supervision. Client duties, more onerous, there's more responsibility on the client, so the client cannot get away with things anymore. Um, they are responsible for managing a project rather than just reasonable steps to ensure that the project is, is progressing. And they also have to now monitor the principal designers and principal contractors. But who's going to help the client understand what their duties are? This is where I think CDMCs might come back in. 
because they are very good at coordinating and understanding what the responsibilities are of the different parties. So they might be brought back in at, in some different guise. That, that's, that's my view. I think we're not quite rid of, of CDMCs yet. And as I said, there's, there's definitions for pre-construction information and construction phase planning are pretty much required on every single project, which might affect the smaller projects when they're not used to doing this sort of thing. Now, there were recommendations um, as a result of the consultation period and the review of that consultation. The recommendations, as I said, there was, di there was strong support for all of those proposals that I put on the previous slide. But as I say, in summary, there is support for a written construction uh, phase health and safety plan for all construction projects. Uh, they believe that the transitional uh, provisions from 2007 to 2015 require some flexibility. They also suggest that there should be clearer guidance for CDM. And it looks like 81% of non-CDM coordinators have agreed that CDMCs should go. I don't think CDMCs will agree with that. Um, and also it looks like client duties will have to be revisited because as much as they're giving clients uh, more responsibility, it should well be managed because clients at the moment don't necessarily know what their duties are. And lastly, those of you who have come to talk before will be fully aware that I have a, a slight dislike for the HSE. <laughs> Today is not HSE bashing, I, I, I have not done it and I've refrained from it. Um, I will talk for the last two minutes about fees for intervention and whether or not it is working. How many in the room have been made subject to a fees for intervention notice or notice of contravention or seen one? Not many. Not too many. Not many. Okay. I mean, that, that almost flies in the face of what the agency is saying because they're saying they are doing a, a pretty good job of dishing these out um, and they're dishing them out to the right people. There was a review in June about fees for intervention and is it working and are they targeting the right people and are they doing what they said they were setting out to do um, when, it, when it came into force. Um, it said that they feel, fees for, this, is, this is from the HSC, it's not from me, the HSC feel that they have proved fees for intervention is effective in achieving the aim of shifting the cost of health and safety regulation from the public purse to those that are guilty of breaching health and safety legislation. Okay, fair enough. They also uh, have accepted that it's proved unpopular with duty holders and, and inspectors also, because some agency inspectors have left as a result of these for intervention because it's not what they signed up to do when they became uh, part of the HSC uh, many years ago. But unfortunately, they feel there's no suitable alternative to fees for intervention. They have said there's no reason to conclude that the overall level of compliance with health and safety legislation has changed as a result of fees for intervention. And there is also no evidence that fees for intervention is being used as a cash cow to generate revenue. I won't ask how many room feel to generate revenue. I, I'm in that camp. But, um, they feel there is no evidence to suggest that's the case. They are targeting those that are blatantly breaching health and safety legislation. The recommendations as a result of the June review, however, is that fees for intervention is here to stay. Yay! So, you know, all the concerns that a lot of people, a lot of duty owners have had, um, suggesting you know what is a material breach and there's no sort of independence with appealing fees for intervention. All of that has almost fallen by the wayside because the HSC has said fees for intervention is here to stay because there is actually no suitable alternative. The threshold for cost recovery, the definition of material breach, the way in which inspectors are dealing with inspections is appropriate. The dispute process, which is something I'm very interested in, is under review. So they have accepted that there's some issue about independence when it comes to appealing these notices that are coming through the door. However, they've not said how they're going to review that. <coughs> there should be some guidance for fees for intervention um, about uh, how they go about imposing these notices for duty holders. And also they're going to consider how the notices are being uh, drafted. So they don't just deal with actions um, and legal considerations, but they're actually a bit more practical about it and explanatory about what the breaches are and how you remedy those. So I mean, take from that what you will. Fees for intervention, as I said, this, this regime has been around a while. 
Um, we've all got our concerns about it, but it's here to stay. And we have to just keep on top of the fact that the HSC are reviewing it. And if we have concerns about it, they should be raised with the HSC at every given opportunity. But they are listening, but whether they action that is a problem. That's it. This will stop through 2014. I'll say any questions. <laughs> um, I'm happy to, to ask questions if there are any. If there aren't, thank you for listening. See you next week. Okay, if there are any questions, we will take them up, although I'm conscious that kids need to wait.